About a month ago, I gave you some details on the Boosted project I'm working on, and I asked you for some input regarding features you would like to see implemented. Thanks a lot to all of you who have provided me with ideas and feature requirements. Your input is very helpful. Today I am giving you an update on the progress so far. Welcome to the IoTT Channel Development Lab. I am Hans Tanner. A special welcome to all new subscribers and welcome back to everyone else. I am happy you made it here and thank you for your support of this channel. In video number 128 I showed a modified version of the AUX shield and explained how it is used to connect the DCC input to the booster. I explained the advantages of using a differential input compared to an optocoupler which can introduce asymmetries to the signal timing. In the meantime I have tested the AUX shield and here are the screenshots of the track signal. On the left side is the signal when the track is empty. The signal is a perfect copy of the input. There is no time delay whatsoever. On the right side we see the track signal when a load of 3.5 amps is applied. Also here the symmetry of the DCC signal remains intact. What we see on the load is a light jitter at the time the output is changing polarity, which comes from the slow rate control of the H-bridge. I am currently limiting the slow rate of the output signal to minimize electromagnetic emission. The cost of that is a slightly higher power dissipation during the transition, so it is a trade-off anyway and I may opt to increase the slow rate for the final version of the booster. We will see, but either or, the output signal is looking very good. In this video I am going to focus on short circuit protection, auto reversing and overload protection. Well, the common device we all know when it comes to short circuit protection is the good old fuse and my design goal for the booster is to emulate a fuse as close as possible given the limits of digital hardware. To understand how a fuse works we need to look at the so-called TI diagrams. Here is an example. The horizontal axis shows the current going through the fuse, while on the vertical axis we see the time it takes to blow it at the corresponding current. As we can see, a fuse with a nominal current of 5 amps can of course withstand that current forever, in fact, it can withstand even a higher current of 8 amps for more than 3 hours, so quite an extended period of time for a 60% overload. If the current is doubled to 10 amps, it can still withstand it for about 100 seconds, and in order to blow it in 0.1 second, it takes a current of around 45 amps. When trying to model the same characteristics to protect the booster output, we are running into two problems. First, there is a good chance that the model railroad layout is not capable of providing such a high short circuit current of 9 times the nominal value. Maybe the output of the power supply can't provide it at all, or the used wire gauges lead to a too high voltage drop and will prevent such an amount of current. And the second problem is that even if the layout can produce the current, we cannot measure it accurately with the typical 10 or 12 bit analog to digital converter of the microcontroller. So, as always in life, we need to find a compromise and creating something that behaves similar to a real fuse, but is possible to implement using a microcontroller. And therefore, the first thing to do is to define the relationship between nominal current and short circuit trip current. After some tests I decided to set this multiplier to 1.4. So if the booster is intended to be a 3 amp booster, meaning it can provide 3 amps indefinitely, the trip current is set to 4.2 amps. For a 5 amp booster it would be 7 amps and for an 8 amp booster we would end up with a trip current of 11.2 amps. If I put this into the TI diagram it looks like this. 
Below the nominal current value, the fuse never blows. And once the 140% trip value is reached, it blows with a programmable time delay, making it a slow, fast or super fast blow fuse. In my current Arduino implementation, it is possible to increase the blow delay time of the fuse in increments of 560 microseconds. On these oscillo screenshots, we see the impact of different settings. The blue line shows the track current measured at the analog to digital converter input. When a short circuit occurs, it shoots up to about 4.7 volts. The value is limited by a Zener -er diode in order to protect the analog input of the Arduino. Because of that, the real value is unknown, but it is higher than 11.5 amps. The red line shows the power signal that controls the booster. When it turns low, the booster is switched off and the short circuit current disappears. The time it takes from the moment the short circuit occurs until the booster is shut down is programmable with a user setting called fuse value. Each 10 increments of the value give an additional shutdown delay of 560 microseconds. The maximum value is not limited in the software but care should be taken when increasing it. The power shield board itself is most likely not at risk as the used H bridges can handle more than 40 amps. But the used power supply is probably not capable of supplying the short circuit current longer than a few milliseconds and will shut down or drop the voltage. In this example I am using a 5 amp LED power supply so running a short circuit with more than 11 amps clearly is above the limits of the device. It is possible because some internal capacitors are discharged and the very short current pulse is not detected by the lab power supply or at least is shorter than its reaction time. If the short circuit is applied for longer than the blow delay time and the booster is shut down, I have implemented three options to restore the power. Manual reset, limited auto reset and full auto reset. In manual reset mode, the booster remains shut until the user sends a reset command via the command interface. In limited auto reset mode, the booster switches on after half a second. If the short circuit is still there, it shuts down and tries a third time after another half second. If not successful, it shuts down permanently and a manual reset by the user is needed. And in full auto reset mode, it keeps trying, although the time between two trials gradually increases from 0.5 to 10 seconds with every failed trial. A feature that is related to short circuit protection is auto reversing. Here is how it works. If a locomotive crosses between two power districts supplied by two different boosters with opposite track polarity, a short circuit is generated and detected by both boosters. If one of the boosters is set to auto-reversing, it will change the polarity of its track output immediately after detection and before the booster of the other power district reaches the short circuit blow delay. As a result of the polarity change, the short circuit goes away and both boosters continue to supply power to the track. If the short circuit does not go away after polarity change, which means the short was caused by something else, for example a derailment, the auto-reversing booster will shut down within the specified delay time and the same rules for restoring the track power will apply. So that's in a nutshell how short circuits are treated. One question remains though, and that is how you can determine the maximum short circuit current, which as we have seen, depends on the power supply and the wiring of the layout. So it is very application specific. Well, to make it easy, I have implemented a short circuit current measuring function. It allows to intentionally create a short circuit on the track while it is unpowered. Then click a button and measure the short circuit current for a very short time span of a half millisecond.
This is safe to do and does not cause any harm to either the booster or the layout wiring. Based on the result it is then possible to determine the maximum nominal current for the booster, typically about 70% of the short circuit current. Going back to the TI diagram, we now have covered the range below nominal current, which can be sustained forever, and the range above the short circuit trip current, which leads to a programmable immediate shutdown, possibly only after first trying to reverse the polarity and test if the short circuit remains. Now, like with the real fuse, the interesting range, of course, is between nominal current and trip current value, so the range where there is a moderate overload of the booster, but not a short circuit. Think about a heavy train climbing a grade, for example. In this range, the fuse will eventually blow, but the time it takes depends on the current. Well, to be precise, on the temperature of the fuse. The current through the fuse causes the fuse to warm up until the melting temperature of the metal is reached, then it blows. So it really is a function of the energy that remains in the fuse, which is the product of the square of current and the resistance of the fuse, integrated over time. In addition to that, the fuse is also losing energy, which can be calculated as the temperature difference to the environment times a thermal transfer resistance and also integrated over time. If you study the literature, you will find two or three more contributors to the fuse temperature, but these two are the most dominant. So, with that data, it's now relatively easy to calculate the current temperature of the fuse. First, I define the 100% temperature, which is the resulting stable temperature when the fuse is loaded with nominal current. This is the temperature the booster is able to sustain forever. If more current is drawn, the temperature increases into the overload range. For my overload protection, I allow the temperature to go up to 120% before I send the booster into overload shutdown. This allows for overloading the booster for a limited amount of time, with current amounts somewhere between nominal current and short circuit trip current. The overload percentage can be continuously calculated, monitored and indicated in the user interface. So, with that, I am actually sort of emulating the behavior of a real fuse when it comes to overload protection. Also here, the time it takes to reach the 120% temperature value can be configured using the same fuse characteristics value as for the short circuit reaction time. Lower values make the fuse reaching the 120% overload threshold faster, Higher values make it slower and therefore more tolerant to temporary overloads. When looking at the TI diagram, the configurable speed of the overload factor adjustment really represents different slopes of the curve between nominal current and short circuit trip current. Once the overload protection is activated, the booster turns off and waits until the temperature is down to 60%. After that, it either kicks in automatically or waits for the user to reset it depending on the configuration settings. So let's give it a try. For this test I configure the booster for a nominal current of 4 amps. The resulting short circuit trip current therefore is 6.4 amps. The current range between 4 and 6.4 amps causes a booster overload but no immediate shutdown. On the screen we can see the track current and the overload percentage. By the way, this is just a temporary screen to display the values. There is still some work that needs to be done to have current gauges and color indicators for the overload percentage. But that is the stuff I am working on now. As load I am using a power resistor pack where I can select a resistor value that gives me the intended current and for fine tuning I am simply adjusting the track voltage. First I load it with a track current of 2 amps and let it run for a while. We can see the track current displayed in milliamps 
and the overload factor starts to increase and becomes stable at about 50, representing the 50% load. And just in case you wonder why this is 50% if the temperature is driven by the square value of the current, it is because I do not square it. It reduces the workload on the Arduino and it does not matter since I am not calculating real temperatures. Now I increase the current to 4 amps, which over time should bring the overload factor to 100%. And of course the load resistors are now heating up considerably. Of course this temperature calculation is not simulating the real temperature of the H-bridge chips. With 43 amps nominal current, they warm up under a continuous load of 5 or even 8 amps, but nowhere near the, to where it becomes a serious issue. That of course is a different story if you use a motor shield board that has current limits of 3 amps, like the popular L298 based boards, or even the new X8874 board, which has a 7 amp H-bridge chip. If I now go back to say 3 amps load, the overload factor starts moving down and will settle at about 75% as the imaginary booster temperature decreases. Now let's bring the current up to 5 amps, which should result in a 125% overload, therefore reach the overload protection point. If 120% is reached, the booster shuts down and cools off, down to 60%, then restarts again as it is configured for automatic reset. To summarize, here are the key points of the short circuit and overload protection concept. There is a distinction between nominal current and short circuit trip current. The short circuit trip current must be achievable in order to reliably detect a short circuit. The power supply needs to be able to supply it and the layout wiring must be capable of supporting the intended current levels. The trip current is set to 140% of nominal current, opening up a range for dealing with temporary overloads. The nominal current can be supplied indefinitely. Overload is allowed as long as the current is lower than the short circuit trip current and the imaginary temperature is not higher than 120% of the temperature at nominal current load. The fuse factor is configurable, allowing for making it behave like a slow or fast blow fuse or anything in between. Auto reversing is included in the short circuit protection scheme and can be activated in the booster setup. And the reset behavior is configurable for each booster, either automatic or manual. And for short circuit shutdown there is an additional limited auto reset mode. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and I was able to explain how short circuit and overload protection will work. As before I am looking for additional feature requirements or suggestions that would help to make this booster a device that fits the needs of most model railroaders. Please let me know your ideas 
in the comments section below. If you like this video, please click the like button to let me know. It's just a split second for you to do so, but it has a great impact as it tells YouTube to promote this video and the IOTT channel in general to other model railroaders. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.